Thank you very much. Uh, these, are the, these are the people who've given support to their meeting. And I have, from these particular ones, I've received some honorary consulting fees from General Mills and Abbott, and University of Toronto supports it, and I received my salary from the University of Toronto, so that's a conflict of interest. Uh, in terms of other disclosures, um, I don't have any relevant grad or research support. I've received speakers, bureaus, honorary consulting fees from these people. And my major one is that my wife and I are owners and uh, employees of two contract research organizations, Glycemic Index Labs and GI Testing. And uh, to mitigate this, I always uh, declare my conflicts of interest. Neither my companies nor I own any intellectual property related to any of the research we do. And I have divested myself from all uh, financial interest in any uh, companies with whom I have received honorary, with whom my company deals, uh, or, or which we've done business with. So uh, well, this is feedback. So what I hope to do today is review the differences between glycemic uh, response, glycemic index, glycemic load. I want to review the effect of ethnicity on glycemic index, and I want to, we'll be comparing the precision of the original glycemic index methodology with the ISO method, which we kind of recently published a paper on that. So we've heard this morning that it's generally accepted that high glucose, high postprandial glucose is bad for you. It's, and uh, so the question I want to ask is, how do, we, how do we measure that? How do we quantify a glycemic response? How do we measure the effect? And this is particularly relevant if uh, a, a company wants to make a product they wish to make a claim about. We need to have a, a way uh, to talk about this in a proper way. And there are several terms that have been used, and we'll start with glycemic response. This is the one which I think today most people tend to favor, uh, and this is defined by the DRI committee in 2005 of the effects of carbohydrate-containing foods on blood glucose concentration during the time course of digestion. And uh, this, uh, this is okay, but my problem with this is it's a very vague definition, and um, if we wish to compare the gly blood glucose concentrations between potato and barley, for example, this is 67 subjects from a multi-center trial, uh, you can see that the, the barley could be called anywhere from 24% less to 13% higher than the potato, depending on which time you wish to choose. Uh, many people feel that the rise in blood glucose is more relevant than the concentration, and then here we could have a difference as much as 90% almost lower. Uh, and other metrices which are used could be the peak concentration, which is 22%, the peak rise is 56% different, the total area under the curve, incremental area under the curve. These numbers vary tremendously. So basically you could make any claim you wish uh, and just pick the right number, which doesn't seem to me very scientific or objective. So uh, I think that's a problem with the glycemic response concept. Uh, if we could define it a little better, it, it's probably okay, but we haven't as yet. So the glycemic load we've heard a lot about, it was defined originally, as we, Simon said, GI times the grams of carbohydrate. And I think it's important to realize that in epidemiological studies, this concept was applied to the entire diet and it's energy adjusted. So the evidence for the benefit of a glycemic load is an energy-adjusted glycemic load calculation, which really doesn't necessarily apply to individual foods. This is better, all right? So what does this term mean? As Simon said, it's, it's the glycemic response elicited by the glycemic load grams of glucose. So you can change this in two ways. You can change it by changing the glycemic index, or you can change it by changing the grams of carbohydrate. So the glycemic load of, one of two apples is twice the glycemic load of one apple. And I think that's how we generally think about it. But this is not the way the evidence for it is presented. The evidence is presented as an energy adjustment, 
And per 1,000 calories, of course, these two um, servings of apple have the same glycemic load. So I think, you know, I, for me, I find this very confusing, and I, I don't quite know how to interpret it. Uh, of course, the other problem we have is how do we measure this if we're going to claim for it? And of course, you calculate it from the glycemic index. That's fine. We have to know how to measure the GI. We'll get to that in a minute. You could, many foods that are, would be low glycemic load, you can't actually measure their GI because they don't have enough carbohydrate. So here you have to directly determine the glycemic load. So for example, you could take a food uh, and compare it to 50 grams of glucose. You compare a serving of the food, you get an AUC of 30. You read off the graph, you find the curve, the, the number is 15. But I think this needs, this is not in fact correct because the glycemic, the dose response curve for glucose is not linear, it's curved. And so in fact, the glycemic load would actually be 10. Uh, and so when, if you're going to directly measure, uh, you need to determine this dose response curve in the subjects across the range of carbohydrate that the serving of the product contains. And we've published on that, and, and it can be done very accurately. We can assess to one gram accuracy of carbohydrate for glycemic load. So glycemic index was, is, was the first metric of an index of carbohydrate uh, effects on glycemic response, uh, which we derived, derived published in 1981, uh, and it's based on con controlling for the amount of available carbohydrate. And when I was at a meeting in uh, of the FAO Carbohydrate Committee in late 1990s, Hesty Voster said, you know, we really should um, do an interlab study to see how good this, this measure is. So based on that, uh, we did that. And I sent around foods, as many of you probably know this, five foods to different labs around the world, seven experience labs. And most of the people are sitting here in the audience who participated in this study. And what we found, I was a little bit disappointed, that the between lab standard deviation in other words, the means of the, the estimates of the foods from each lab was about nine. I mean, I kind of hoped it might be a bit better. Other people have felt that was fairly large. And I thought, well, you know, we had to cook all these foods. So what if I could do foods which just were, uh, you know, ready to eat? Because we know cooking could affect it. So the second interlab study, we sent two foods which were ready to eat, and I had 28 labs, and some of them were total novices. I had one from every continent in the world, which was really cool. I was very happy about that. Uh, some of the novice labs did extremely well, and some of the very experienced labs did very badly. Uh, and they all know, but I won't say any more. But the answer was actually about the same. But we do know that different labs do have different precision, so that's, that's uh, something. So um, this has these, these data, people have used these studies to bring forth a number of criticisms, uh, people have felt that this is quite inaccurate and, and rather imprecise. Uh, so the inaccuracy, in other words, the, the, the average, the mean is wrong, uh, is, and then was suggested this might be affected by ethnicity. And in terms of imprecise, that standard deviation is a bit large, and the regulatory agencies have suggested we should perhaps use glycemic response instead as being I don't know why they don't give a reason. So I just wanted to, we'd just done a systematic review of uh, the meta-analysis of uh, effective ethnicity on GI, and it's just been accepted for publication. We use kind of normal, uh, normal methods. We reviewed 430 trials. There are eight studies, so this included 28 comparisons of foods among Caucasians and non-Caucasians. I put 585, but some of the studies had, of course, several foods, so the subjects are counted twice. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Here are the results. And overall, we found actually there was a small difference. The non-Caucasians had a slightly higher GI, not quite significant, just missed. It was 0. .0, where are we at here? 0. .06, significant heterogeneity. And when we looked at the data, it appeared that this heterogeneity was explained by rice and a series of studies from New Zealand where they compared uh, the GI rice and Chinese versus Caucasian subjects, European in quite large numbers, 30 in each, showed that the Chinese have a higher number, and they, this was associated with increased chewing. The Chinese chewed the rice into smaller particles, which could explain why they were, had a higher GI, they'd be more rapidly digested. 
Uh, this study didn't show any. So if we took these out and just look at all the other studies, then there's no effect at all. There's a clear effect here driven by these, these studies. So we concluded here uh, that, uh, in fact, uh, there isn't, with the possible exception of rice, there really isn't much difference uh, with ethnicity in GI. Well, what about precision and the precision of glycemic response? Is this actually any better? Is this a better metric than GI? And of course, we can use our interlab study data to compare the glycemic responses of those foods. And just I, to pull it out, I compared the responses of um, the four foods to bread. And Health Canada, in a quite helpful suggestion, suggested that the AUC should be at least 20% lower compared to uh, a reference food. So that, that's the kind of claim or the kind of data you'd have to present to make this kind of a claim, compare to some other food. And indeed, bread would be a very appropriate thing to compare potato rice spaghetti with. So here are the means and standard 95% uh, confidence intervals, potato rice spaghetti barley for the glycemic index. For our labs, you can see for barley, all the labs have a lower, significantly lower GI than bread. Bread is 70. Not shown, but they're there. Here is the percent differences of the labs. And you can see not all of the labs have a significantly lower uh, barley is not significantly less than bread, 100% here. In fact, the mean standard deviation is significantly higher here. Of course, the means are higher, but if we, if we use the uh, coefficient of variation, we still have a significantly higher difference. So glycemic response is not going to be inherently better than glycemic index. Indeed, it could be worse in terms of precision, between lab precision. So the GI methodology has moved. We've had uh, a lot of people have said there isn't a standard method. There is, in fact, a standard method. Uh, and we have a now an ISO method. And the ISO method contains all the same general um, procedures that we had in originally 1981, and that this was the method we used for the two interlab studies. The ISO method, though, includes a few more procedures and cr uh, criteria uh, to which were intended to improve precision. Studies that we had done which demonstrated that you did improve accuracy and precision. Accuracy by excluding outliers, precision by suggesting the reference, the within individual variation of the repeated reference food has to be within a, a lower than a certain amount. You have to use at least 10 subjects, use two fasting samples, improves the accuracy, the precision of the AUC calculation, and your analytical method has to be accurate. And most glucometers, for example, are much higher CV than that. But we didn't actually know whether this actually was any better than the original uh, method. And so recently, one of our clients uh, did a study to look at this. And it was published, presented the FASEB last April. And so I can show the results here. Uh, these are the six foods. And the three labs involved were my R lab, GI labs, Sydney, and a lab by Fortis in France. And these are the means and the 95% confidence intervals of the means for each lab for each of the six foods. You can see they go from high to low GI. You'll note that if they're low GI, they, their 95% confidence intervals do not overlap high in any case. In fact, the same goes if they're high, they don't overlap low. And the mean standard deviation is 4.7 which is a lot less than nine. However, you'll say, well, we don't know that these labs may be quite good labs. So how, is that really a fair comparison? And the, fortunately, these three labs participated in the second interlab study. And here are the means and standard deviations for the same labs for the two foods. And that average is 5.9. So that's a 20% difference. And if you use a CV, it's 30%, over 35% different. So this suggests that the, the new method is actually more precise the way it's supposed to be. It's performing better, perhaps. I wouldn't call this a definitive study, and I'd certainly like to see some more. But I would like to conclude that uh, glycemic index yields more precise results than glycemic response, primarily because we repeat the reference food uh, so we get a more representative value for the, what we're comparing against. You could do that for glycemic response if you wished. With the possible exception of rice, foods, GI values don't differ if they're measured in 
Caucasians and non-Caucasians. I think this is a very interesting observation and sh should be followed up. And certainly in Asia, uh, you know, and where rice is a, is a food, this is an important issue. And I think that the current ISO method may be more precise than the original method. The mean between lab standard deviation is now down to five, uh, less than five. Although I think we probably would like to have some more confirmation of that. So thank you very much. Thank you, John, for an excellent, uh, precise and accurate discussion.